There's a good pink. And then we've got. <laughs> I'm Emily. I'm the local peace economy coordinator for Pink. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, as Jody said, really excited to see some new faces and always your support as you have questions or reflections. Um, so I'm just going to post some announcements in the chat and I will do that again at the end of the call. But I did see at least one person has to leave early. So I'm sure you all get this. Um, and then we're going to move into some grounding as we always do. It's just showing up on the chat in one second. And all of this will also be in the, I would say it's too long. Um, and also a reminder, if you haven't to just note your name and where you're, you're coming in from. Um, and add yourself to the padlet that um, Emily is about to post. Yeah, sorry. Do you know that chat had a, um, a limit on characters? Um, but all of this information will be in the follow-up email. So if you don't want to go through it right now, and um, please, please don't. We'll get it all out to you. Um, there it is. Okay. So we always start these calls with a piece of culture from the culture worker. We've talked about before how this work really starts with culture and art, um, because that's where culture shifts. And as a way to like return to ourselves connect with our own humanity um, as we move into this work. Um, so as Jody said, tonight is, um, we're talking about the pivot from limitation to imagination. So we're gonna begin with a poem called There is an Edge, parentheses, Ode to Radical Imagination by Adrian Marie Brown, who I believe I, we've shared um, quotes and poems from her before. So I'm just going to take a moment. I invite you to do the same to just ground in your body for a moment. Maybe take a breath. Put your hand to your heart or your belly or feel your feet on the ground. There is an edge owed to radical imagination. There is an edge beyond which we cannot grasp the scale of our universe. That border that outer boundary is imagination. The only known edge of existence, the only one we can prove by universal, by universal experience. We can imagine so much. We can only imagine so much. If perhaps it is a function of our collective minds, a dream of our endless nights, then there will be abundance so long as we can imagine it. Abundance on earth, if we can imagine it. Our abundance of earth, or abundance of earths, a sphere for every tribe and every combination. And to have it all, all we need is to remember there is an edge and grow our dreams beyond it. Thank you so much. So um, I see some new faces. Um, this is where we kind of just check in if there's anything somebody wants to share from last week, or if you're new, um, we interesting to hear why you've joined us. Uh, so just raise a hand, um, which you can do by um, going down to the bottom under reactions. Um, if anybody has anything to share before we move into saying more about imagination, because I see some new features, but no sharing. Anybody want to share what brought them here? If you're new, Sherry, my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I'm new. I guess that's all I have to say. Um, I've I've just been watching the wonderful work that Cook Pink does from afar, and I've been busy as probably everybody is, but I just am less busy now. So I wanted to be more more participatory. Cool. And where are you from? Uh, Berkeley. Oh, nice. Cool. Thank you for joining. Anyone else have something to share? Kath, Kath, Catherine, right? No, Chris, I Kristen. Kristen, <laughs> it was started with a C. Um, well, I've, I've demonstrated for years, um, um, you know, 
on liberal causes. And but I'm so aware that I'm absolutely locked into this economy which um supports terrorism around the world. And um so you know what else can an individual do? So that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And your Western Mass, just so everybody knows um, where you are from. Yes, Western, Ma Western Mass, yes. Can you say like a city? Oh, um, well, um, I guess uh, I'm South Hadley, but no one's ever heard of South Hadley, but um, I'm near... Um, I'm near Northampton, which is a liberal city. Yes, very cool. Thank you. Um, all right. If there isn't anyone, oh, there we go, Becky. Hi. Uh, yeah, I actually came to the information meeting you had a couple weeks ago about the tool and the book and everything, which was like, that's really cool. I mean, it's like, knocked my socks off. Um, but what caused me to come to that meeting in the first place was earlier this year in the springtime, I stumbled on the Peace on Earth by 2030 movement that David Gershon um, and the Peace Game. And I've been trying to round up some people to, to do that with me. And then I heard about this and I thought, huh, I wonder how they because I feel like they have to mesh well. Um, so I'm kind of scouting for the others to say, okay, this is how maybe we could do a nice mashup and you know leverage your cool website and the workbook and the, the framework that the David Gershon has set up with his peace game. Very cool. Thank you. You know, share with keep, you know, as you do it, share with us how that's working. Thank you. Okay. Don. Oh, this John? No, Don, who just disappeared. <laughs> no, Don's still here. They just took shoes. Oh, there you are. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm Don. I'm very active in the peace movement here in Portland. Peace and Justice Works, Veterans for Peace, Code Pink, Alliance for Democracy. Honest Elections, Physicians for National Health Program. I'm a former nurse, and I'm wanting to get back into the nursing field. Super excited to be here. Uh, I'm just, uh, I get really depressed if I'm not busy all the time. So uh, there's a lot of things in this world to be depressed about. Um, <laughs> thank you for having this. Thank you for being with us, Dawn, and thanks for being a caregiver. Um, that is the peace economy. So thank you for that. Um, much needed in this time. We talk about that a lot of how little we know how to care and how missing it is from our culture. So um, do we have any more shares? John. So oh, yes. Hello, um, I've missed some of the Zoom meetings, but unfortunately, but I'm glad to be back. And um, just wanted to say a couple of things. One, I have <clears throat> I got quite recently, like within the last hour, the um, uh, download on uh, peace economy versus war economy. So I've gotten to the first 13 pages and uh, find it interesting. I've been a rebel all my life. And so as a consequence, I really don't feel uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's unusual. Uh, I, I hope that others can get past it. But I also wanted to share, um, uh, Moji has been part of this. I guess you know Moji Aga. Yeah. Um, and um, he wanted, to, wanted me to, to say that he is very busy, feel that his concept of chambers of compassion is quite closely related to the concept of the peace economy. I'm reading this. And uh, and if you like, uh, there could be a um, 
Zoom meeting set up such that um, such that there could be a dialogue on this matter. He he does feel that that if if this can go locally and then um, uh, statewide, nationwide, and maybe even worldwide, that it may um, may play a very important role in trying to um, change the world to make it better. Uh, thanks, John. Please, please let him know. Happy to do that. We would be happy. Like all these conversations, that's all part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, um, you know, the the piece this is happening globally it is and i would say it's happening least in the united states so um it is something that is happening globally and happening across the country and i'm blown away i know emily is by how how much is growing and how many people are are creating new ideas and yes john i think um when you've been able to stay a rebel your life and outside of the 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 constraints of um the war economy, it's its a lot easier and you're used to feeling uh, uncomfortable and you're, you're comfortable in, in uncomfort and discomfort, which is what we're getting everyone to practice to be in. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, let's let's move into what we were gonna talk about today. And, and that's imagination. So, you know, when we look at the war economy and the addictions it forces on us to succeed inside of it, one of the things is limitation. And I have to say at the DNC, I really got to witness this. And with the elections, you really get to, to witness this. And it's it, we witness it in ways that those that are inside of the boxes are so unaware that they're in the boxes and how constrained that makes your thinking. And it goes to what John was saying about the discomfort comfort part, because you are made to feel uncomfortable if you walk outside of the box. The Those around you, the culture that's created the spaces of safety will make you feel uncomfortable if you get out of that box. So let's just look at this moment. Let's look at Palestine. Right now, students are going back to school and already the universities have created boxes of limitations that are allowing them to come to school. This is a university. So, you know, I want to I want to talk about how education even creates the limitation, but here we have universities already creating a box for students and saying you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, and if you do that, this will happen. This is a university where you're supposed to be coming to the space where your imagination flourishes. And instead, the limitation is before you enter the door. And we've seen this in the last year, but I want to point out that, you know, always these things are just a manifestation of the bigger. So it's not just about Palestine. It's about everything. And and that that those boxes, I mean, I'm 70, so I'm I'm looking at it for you know the 55 years that I've been looking. If I look about the boxes where people can think from, they are so narrow. But one of the things that I found, I just saw um a study, and it's from Axiom, not a you know, not a news source that I go by, but I just thought it was interesting when they did this research that. After 9-11 and the Iraq War, Democrats and Republicans both declined in their trust of mainstream media, of course. Then we get to 08 and the crash, and the decline goes even further down. But then we get to 2017, and the graph goes in a whole different way. 10% of the Republicans trust the mainstream media and 80% of the Democrats. So... I just want to like, for me, I was always wondering like, how did Germany work? Like, here's the smartest people in Europe become the fascists. And it's very interesting what happens to us in education, that we're educated in this narrow form that then we can be hooked into 
and used by. And that happens at our universities, that the agreed upon, and this happens in science, happens in medicine, it happens in all the fields, that we don't even understand how limited the field is itself in what is acceptable. So as we start to talk about imagination, I think the, the important part to pay attention to is the limitation. So um, because what I want you to practice this next week is really pushing at those edges that um, Emily started us out with, like really pushing past the edges. And one of the things we see, you know, that I'm sure people come into conversations about the elections, which we can't talk about at Code Pink, but here's the part we can talk about. They're so freaking binary. And binary is one of the tools of the war economy, which is what limits our thinking. I mean, that we're limited to two choices is already a lack of imagination. Like that's already such a narrow box. So when everybody's like, but there's only Trump and 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 uh Kamala, but that's so limiting. And I want to talk about the power of the unconditional, um, um, uncommitted delegates. So here's an example of imagination. Um, and I, I actually was there when it happened. So I, I wanted to share like a, a piece of brilliance of breaking through and creating a lever of change that is really huge, but nobody talks about it. So the guy who was the chief of staff to Cori Bush when um, he's seeing that there is no way for, you know, Palestinians to have a voice in this primary election where everything's been closed down, he says, I have to quit and go home to Michigan and run this uncommitted campaign because I have to give people a place to engage because they feel powerless already. I have to give them something. So he creates his uncommitted campaign. Well, first of all, like, I think it, it I think it was like two weeks. I, I mean, it was some very short period of time where he got an enormous amount that moved into the uncommitted category, right? Like it was able to make a statement. So it was about making the, um, the um, unseen scene. By creating the uncommitted, he was able to give a number to what was not gonna be even mentioned, right? He gave a number to those who were not in agreement with Biden and couldn't vote for him because of the stand for on Gaza. And then immediately it moves to the other states that still have primaries left. And I think Minnesota, it was like 22% or some huge percent, right? So he builds this movement speaking to those who don't want to get stuck in a binary, do have an imagination, can come up with something. And so what happens is it is that campaign that gives people power outside of the binary. And so let's just say, let's look at the binary of how power and greed works. Power and greed works by putting us in the binary and the limited. And so he broke out of that. And what happened? He got the freaking president of the United States to have to stop being the candidate in the election. Now, everybody, like that all happened. That's huge. When we talk about leveraging power and making a change and nobody could move this, but these people did by breaking out. So that is imagination that is breaking out of the binary. There is power out there. I just... You can witness that. So I've, I've just showed you the limitation. Now I'm showing you the imagination because I want you to feel the possibility of what happens when you break out of the limitation because it is there. We just watched it. Now, the next thing that happened is when we walked out of the convention and they're like saying, you know, like, no, there can't be a, a, a Palestinian voice. And I'm like, oh, we're just going to sit in and we'll get one, right? So I'm sitting out there with some of the young people and they're like, well, what if we lose? What if we don't get a voice? And I said to them, there's no losing. Don't you understand? 
the sit-in is a win because nonviolent direct action exposes the violence of the structures we are in. So either you get a Palestinian voice or you don't. If you don't, you have exposed the violence of power. Now, which is very important. Like, and I want to talk about this, like, it's like the the limitation feels defined and the imagination feels like out there, right? But actually in going outside of the limitation into imagination, you actually create more definition for people to be able to feel related and make choice. So what happened with the non-Palestinian vote and the sit-in was that even with Kamala's statement, the truth was she had failed the Palestinians. So she can say she wants them to be humanized, but her, those were the words, but her actions were dehumanization. So it created a specificity of truth, of, relate, of relatable, of ground. And I just wanna, you know, as I've said so many times and I will keep saying always, one of the ways that, that that we get used by the war economy are these proxies. And I, I've never seen it, like at the Democratic Convention, I would say the pro it was a proxy. That's all it was, was a proxy. There was nothing real or true or authentic or relational. It was like, it was all proxy. It was a presentation. And our hearts and minds and souls are, are starved for truth, for reality, for relationality. So all this work we're doing and breaking away uh, from these structures of these 20 through ad three addictions that the war economy forces on us into these peace economy habits is getting out of proxy. So it's, it's, it's this sense of really working on what are, where am I in a binary? Noticing when it comes up, when the answer is yes or no, when it's this or that. It's like, but what are all the other choices that aren't on the table? And even if they're, make them up, imagine them. What could other choices be? Because if you imagine what other choices can be, then you can create that other choice and get people out of the, out of the box. And I think that's basically what the peace economy is. It's like, instead of us being used by the war economy every day, we're breaking out of that as our only choice into creating other things, into other possibilities. So I would say the whole peace economy itself, even though, so it's um, it's the rooted in the flow. Alexis has it in her, in her image that she, she has today and it's like, I am rooted, but I flow. So it's like the constant work of the peace economy is to root ourselves in our community, in something other than the war economy, and yet having that capacity to flow. And that it's in that flow, in that space of where we can move into possibilities, into what doesn't exist, into what's not in the room, into what's not being articulated, into, um, into places that feel uncomfortable and unknown. And I, you know, like into all these places that we talk about, it's there where life becomes at that edge of becoming. And we have to be able to create those edges. And in permaculture, life happens at those edges. So I think the other thing to take from the poem today is the edge. Where am I at the edge and breaking through where, where the aliveness is? Um, so, um, when, when the war economy is keeping us in the box, it, and it punishes you for coming out of the box, we also have to be able to, like, recognize those punishments and speak to them. Like, why is this happening? Who's gaining from it? I'm not gaining from it. And that goes back to the care piece of the nurturance piece. And um, I, I call it, you know, the, the separating the chicken from the bones, you know, it's like, that feels like a bone that feels like nourishment. It's like, where, you know, where are these things feeling like bones and you know, stone soup, and where is it actually chicken that we've, you know, and constantly 
finding the place where you can get the proxies out of your life and reality into your life. And it's, it's funny because I find imagination part of reality because it is the, 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 all the, the openness of our capacity to see, to feel, experience, taste, um, have reality. And that sense of constantly being in the question. Um, and also, I just want to say in those boxes, there's no humor and humor is medicine. And in the edges, there's humor, there's joy, there's laughter. Um, so, you know, having the practice of where are my edges? Where is the binary? You know, binaries are quick. You know, they want quick answers. They're, there's there's no depth to them. Like, how do you, how do you, where's the depth? Where's the, the wisdom? There's no wisdom in the binary. Um, and, and also I say it's the binary is what puts us to sleep in the first place. It's in the sense of this waking up to aliveness. Um, it's the binary that puts us to sleep. Um, and so it's, you know, it's the constant coming out of the comfort zone, that sense of being uncomfortable. And, um, I, I was, you know, someone mentioned earlier, just, you know, the stress of, of living right now and how much we have to take in and, um, that if the war economy is this killer and we are cultivating the peace economy, we it's like, if we don't, we're not serving the cure. You know, the monster exposes the cure, releases the cure. It's like seeing ourselves as the cure, but if we're not engaging in it, the cure isn't being developed. And the war economy has a way of, keeping our attention, you know, constantly pulling us in, keeping our attention, making us afraid, terrorizing us, you know, how to just like let that be white noise because our fingers aren't on it. It is doing that thing. What are we doing? If it's doing that thing, it's doing that thing. But what are we doing to create the other? And um, so, um, in the in the in this week, I, I just suggest it's like, what is the playful exploration you can have of breaking open the boundaries? And when you know, I'm gonna go back to like when I was at the convention, I couldn't believe how narrow the narrative that people are living in was and how afraid. And even, you know, as I spoke last time about being at the RNC. The DNC was even like again scarier. Like we were reading names of Palestinians that had been killed as people came out of the convention, and people were coming out of the convention with their ears plugged. Like that's how afraid they are just to even be able to feel what is happening right now, and so it's like the br br the brittleness that happens when you live in the box is another thing to remember. So sorry, I talk so much. Um, I, I'll move it over to Emily. There's so much to say. Sorry, Emily. It's all good. I was trying to capture some of that, those good nuggets in the in the chat there. Um, so before we move into breakout rooms, we're just gonna do a, sh a short um, activity to kind of play with these, con these um, our relationships with limitation, imagination, definition that comes from imagination that Jody talked about. So um, hopefully most of you saw this in the a reminder email to bring a piece of paper and something to write with. But if you don't have that, um, if you're able to get that, um, that would be great. If you'd like to participate in this activity. Um, and this activity is, was originally called 30 circles and it came from a place called I IDEO and typically it's done with 30 circles, but we're gonna do a modified version for the sake of time. Um, so with your piece of paper, I'm, I think I'm gonna have to take off my, um, my, uh, my background here. So give me one second. 
So you can see. Okay. Um, so with your piece of paper, if you could draw 12 circles like this, don't worry about them being perfect circles. As I've said before, perfectionism is a tool of the war economy. Um, so 12 circles. And then we're going to have a minute and a half, and I'll take care of the time, to fill in as many circles as you can with recognizable objects. So I'll just give you an example. I'll just do one. And um, again, you don't have to be an artist to do this. Um, I drew a soccer ball. That's my version of a soccer ball in this moment. <laughs> so again, the goal is to fill in as many circles as possible with recognizable objects. Um, we're trying to pivot away from rushing and quantity in the peace economy, but for the sake of this exercise, we are trying to fill in as many as possible as a way to get out of the thinking mind that might perseverate about what to draw or try to make each circle look perfect. Um, so before we begin, um, does anyone have any questions? Well, then the, I'll, I'll offer some reflection questions at the, after we finish, but does anyone have any questions? Maybe any clarification? Kristen? I couldn't see what object you drew. I drew a soccer ball. Kind of, yeah, that's oh, okay. That's... Okay. Let me get my timer ready. All right. And begin. All right, time's up. You put your ready utensils down if anybody, as Jody's doing, if anybody wants to show, do a little show and tell. Beautiful artwork. So this was a way to kind of get out of our heads a little bit, have a little fun, play a little bit. Um, do something maybe beyond the uh, rigidity of what we, what we might be doing in our day to day. And also to me, I think this can really um, show us a lot about our relationship to imagination, creativity, limitation. Take a look at what you made. What do you notice? Are there any patterns that you see? Did you get in a certain neural pathway and you kept going with it in a way that was maybe really creative or really limiting? Does anything surprise you that what you drew? Did you feel limited by the circles or did they feel like they supported your creativity? What limitations did you feel like were on, were imposed on you by the activity? Did you impose any limitations on yourself? I know I often can take rules really literally. Um, so maybe, you know, had this been the first time I did this, I may have thought I needed to stay inside the circle. But as you can see in mine, you know, I drew this flower here and got outside the circle. Some people may have, you know, I could have made a snowman out of these three circles together. Um, so yeah, just kind of like I, I 
bringing a curiosity to um to where limita limitation showed up for you in this activity where imagination showed up what part of you was leading this activity was it your imagination was it your perfectionism was it the part of you that was focused on following directions or quote unquote getting it right all these different parts of us can show up um, and it's just good to be aware of what our relationships are um, to these things as we're um, engaging our imagination um, in the peace economy. So if you, you're welcome to share any reflections in the chat, um, but we are going to go into breakout rooms. I hope you had fun with that. Thanks for thanks for playing with, with me. <laughs> um, and feel free to share any reflections about that uh, in your breakout rooms as well. Um, but as Adrian Marie Brown, the poet I shared earlier, she says that we're living in someone else's imagination and it's a white supremacist, capitalist, colonialist imagination. And as we've talked about tonight, we can live and live into a different imagination, but we first have to go there ourselves. So our imagination is where we gather the seeds that we can plant into the world and actually bring into our communities. So that's what we'll be doing a little bit tonight in our breakout rooms. I'll read the question. It looks like Jody's posting in the chat and we'll broadcast it as well. How do you or can you connect with your imagination? When you release all the narratives about what's realistic or possible, what do you imagine for the future of your community? And maybe even imagine yourself for a moment in the future you want to live in, perhaps walking down the street or sitting somewhere in your community. What do you see, smell, taste, feel? So that's the invitation. And then um, the invitation is to share with, with groups. And please just keep time so that everyone has a chance to share. Um, Jody, what do you think of a breakout rooms in terms of members? Um, I'm ready to put everybody in a room. Make sure you just uh, click on the room and go in and take care of each other. So welcome back everyone. Is everyone's filtering back in? Just a reminder to please mute, um, just to eliminate background noise. There's a good chance you're coming back from here breakout rooms and I'm just going to put the announcements in the chat one more time. Um, especially if you're new, please take a look at them. It has some great resources, but again, they'll all be um, in the follow-up email as well. But if you're, if, you know, if you hear us talking about the workbook and the website, you know, if you don't know what those things are, um, those things are included here in the chat um, in the announcements. Um, oh, thank you, Catherine. Glad you. Oh, <laughs> um, so we do. We don't have much time. Um, typically, we have more time for sharing out. Um, but if folks want to share in the chat, or maybe we could get one or two people say a brief word about um, reflections that came up um, in the breakout room that you wanted to share. Maybe you want to share what's coming up for them around imagination. Pat? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a good conversation. We talked about, um, you know, imagining a different narrative and uh, how it's, you know, not just difficult for, for me, you know, because we have the whole Zionism, patriarchy, capitalism, um, you know, which is getting all the mainstream press um but just that a lot of people are um kind of uh they don't they don't know anything different they don't they don't have the resources or the uh time to take a take a stand or or to to take think outside the box or to because they don't see that other narrative of peace and uh it's it's been so silenced um and it's like the scarcity mentality of there's never enough it's always been like that you know which is just like crap in my opinion but mm -hmm. so we also talked about the responsibility for us who of virtue you know for whatever reasons have capacity and 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 have practiced this this imaginative way of thinking about envisioning and and even working towards a different world we have to provide opportunities for people to 
for everybody to to be outside the box. And that's one of the things that I, I certainly am engaged in doing right now with the Kite Project and other projects like that with my ceasefire rally group. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, you're, you're, what you're saying is reminding me, I believe, I think, if someone knows that this is incorrect, please put it in the chat. I think it's Tony Cade Bambara who said something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing, but our job is to make the revolution irresistible. The job Yes, of oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's it. To make the revolution irresistible. That's right. Okay, that's true. Because if you are allied, really allied, with seeing into the into the dynamics of the natural world around you. And if you make that a practice, what you discover is mind boggling and so thrilling, you can't turn away. And that feeds your activism for a different world. Absolutely. One of the programs that I, one of the school districts I taught in had a program called Embracing Our Differences. And what they did is they had students from junior high through high school, I think even um, elementary school, come up with a phrase, you know, what, what does this mean to you? And so they pick the best phrases and then they'd send them to the art artists, arts oh, artists throughout the school district. And they did these huge billboards mm. and they put the billboards in a couple of different parks in, in the county. And so people every year would go and they would tour yeah. the Embracing Our Differences um, uh, presentation, you know, mm. public presentation, which I thought was brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So I do wanna respect people's time. So thank you all so much for coming, for playing tonight, for connecting with your imagination. The one thing I'll leave you with is the question, I was talking about this with Dominique um, while you were all in breakout rooms. One question that I didn't say earlier that um, is kind of a way into imagination for me too, is how do I connect to my imagination when I was a kid? And we all have different, you know, spans of time in which, you know, our childhood is closer or nearer depending on our age, but um, yeah, how did I connect to my imagination when I was a kid? And I'm just going to leave you with that in case it sparks anything, um, a way for you to play um, with your imagination over the next two weeks. And our next call, September 11th, the link is in the chat to register. And hope to see you there. And please reach out if you need anything in the meantime. Thank you all. Thank you.